All right, so so far we've been dealing with solving equations here. We start off with 7.1, learning this new process called the square root method. And that process only led us into 7.2. So once we learned how to use the quadratic formula, we really did not need the square root process. We good? We use it sometimes, yes. So this little process of the square root method of solving equations, we'll still use it two particular instances. We used it last time in 7.4 to finish off a problem and uh, we're going to use it in terms of graphing as well sometimes. Alright, does that make sense? So the quadratic formula replaces the process, the square root process, most of the time. So whenever you're dealing with trinomials, you're trying to factor a trinomial or trying to finish off an a, a, uh, equation one of two processes. You either say I can factor this down and I factor it and done, or I say I do the quadratic formula. Okay, does that make sense? So that, that's the square root method used very rarely. All right, graphing parabolas. Let's go to this one here. So, why the big humongous table? Just to tell you that if you're ever stuck and you don't know what a graph looks like, you can always plug in a table. Plug in a table works all the time. You can do that with linear equations, with parabolas, exponential functions here, logarithmic functions. You can always use a table. <coughs> the whole point of graphing those is to see, you know what, is it possible to do it a little bit faster? That's kind of the question now at 7.5. So up until this point, even in math 61, I don't think we got to graphing parabolas. So we're just sort of left with this sort of table method. And so you can tell it's pretty tedious, isn't it? Blah, 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 plug it in, you get so many points, and eventually you should see a little pattern here as well. With parabolas, you always see a pattern. And the parabola looks like this, which I think you guys know, comes down usually to a certain point. And this point is very important. It's called the vertex. And then it comes back up. Or the other option is that it goes from the bottom. It goes up to a certain point and then comes back down. So you have sort of have that other option. Okay. Instead of plugging in points and plugging in points and plugging in points, is there any faster method to do this? And of course, since we have 7.5, I'm sure there is. Yes, there is. In fact, it's a three-step process. Some steps take longer than others. Some steps are really, really easy to figure out. But here's, our, here's what we want to do. We want to be able to graph a parabola really, really quick. And the first easiest point to ever do is the y-intercept. Y-intercept is the easiest because, notice what we're here, y is equal to c. So remember the y-intercept is when x is equal to 0, right? So if x is equal to 0, this x squared goes to 0, this goes to 0. So notice what you're left with. You're just left with a constant c. Easiest point to plug in. Love it that your book does it first because most textbooks leave this for last. Think you might as well do the first one easy x-intercepts and notice it says if they exist all right why the world if they exist because if there's a complex answer there's no intercepts remember the x-axis is called a real number line and that's what it that's what it's all about if you have a real number you're gonna have a point along the axis the x-axis if you have a complex answer for this discriminant that you have no x-intercepts and then that what gives you the x-intercepts is the quadratic formula. Now, real quick here, do we always have to use the quadratic formula? No. If we can factor, we might as well just factor and be done. Okay. And then the vertex. This is the other one. When do I? Where do I know the x vertex is at? This little formula here. Notice it's the beginning part of the quadratic formula. Kind of fun how that works out. Again, not going to go into where this comes from but negative b over 2a. Here's our, our vertex. Okay, so parabolas, they look like this. They either go down to a point and go up, and there's my vertex right here. Or they're coming from the bottom, they go up to the top, and they come back down, and my vertex is the highest point. So here, minimum point for the vertex, maximum point for the vertex. All right, let's look at example number one. Let's see what we got. I want to sketch the graph of y is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 5. That's what I want to do. Step number one. 
Uh, what's my y-intercept? Yeah, it doesn't even tell you that. It doesn't even talk about it because it's so easy, right? Y-intercept is 5. So now, to find the x-intercepts, we're going to set the parabola equal to 0. Hey, this one factored. I like that. This one factored. No need to use the quadratic formula. x equals 5, x equals 1. There's two x-intercepts. So now I have three points for this graph. Is that right? Now for the vertex. I plug into this formula. x is equal to negative b over 2a. I plug in the b, which is negative 6. The 2 is part of the formula. The a is the one in front. I get myself a 3. Now this is the x-coordinate. I only got the x-coordinate of my vertex. So hold on, though. If I know the x-coordinate of something, can I just plug it in to get me the y-coordinate? Absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug this 3 back into our parabola. Blah, 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 blah. And now I get the y-coordinate. So really here, we really easy, I think. We have, have four points, and I know what this parabola looks like. I got all the important points. I found the y-intercept, I found the x-intercepts, I found the vertex, and that's really all I need for a nice, good graph. And notice real quick here, I only needed to plug in once. I only did one plug-in during this whole entire time, as opposed to making a table and plug it in five times, six times, seven times, eight times. So, all right, the other thing about the vertex that's kind of cool is because I know where the middle of the graph is as well. I know the middle of the graph is at 3, negative 4. Because sometimes when you plug in values, you don't know where the middle of the graph is. It keeps on going further down and further down and further down. It's like, whoa, where's the, where's the vertex here? And so you don't know. Now we know. Okay, so plugging in these points here, there's my y-intercept, my two x-intercepts, my vertex, and based upon the, uh, those four points, I can graph my parabola and done. Okay, we're good there? Let's go for it. The uh, match problems doesn't give you a lot of space to work, to work with, so if you want to have another little sheet of paper next to it, that's fine. Okay, some more vocabulary, just real quick here. Remember how I said this can either um, go down to a certain point and come back up? We call these guys concave up. So just real quick, just bounce back real quick here. This guy we call concave up. This guy we call concave down. Again, are you going to see that on a test? No, but that's the way we sort of talk about them. Okay, so let's go for it. Let's do the easy one here. Yes, question. Sure. The question is, what's the difference between an x-coordinate and an x-intercept? Let's go to here. Uh, the x-intercepts are the points along the x-axis where they touch. So there's my 1 and 5. Good there? That would be the x-intercept. It's when it touches the x-axis. Uh, x-coordinate is just this first number right here. Whenever you say the x coordinate is, you're saying it's 3. That means I don't know what the y coordinate is. Good. But once I know what the y and the x coordinates are, now I have myself a point. Cool. Good. Good vocabulary question there. I like that. That's awesome. Okay. All yours based upon example number one. All right. I'm going to start as well here since I see just a few people are done already here. So y-intercept, I think you guys said at negative 3. Easy enough. So if you want to make it into a point, it'll be 0 comma negative 3. I'm going to stay to the point. The x-intercept is going to be this whole parabola set equal to 0. And again, it doesn't really matter if you put the 0 on the left or the right. All right, at this point, I can factor. So how about x minus 3 and x plus 1 will that work. Therefore, if I can solve for x, I get a 3 and a negative 1. Therefore, 0, 3, 0, and negative 1, 0 are my x-intercepts. Sweet. Everything working fine here. Number 3. is the vertex. And the vertex has a special formula here. It's negative b over 2a. And so the b value is a negative 2. 
2 times the 1 gets ourselves a 2 over 2 which is a 1 and again this is the only time you do have to plug that number back in to get the y coordinate because you only realize the x coordinate and how about a negative 4 and so the vertex is at 1 negative 4 I got everything I need. I got a parabola that shows me all the important points on here. So, 0, negative 3, uh, 3, 0, negative 1, 0, and then my vertex is at 1, negative 4, and again, it should all make sense. It should all sort of, you should be able to draw it into a parabola. Uh, the only thing is, don't do like a V shape. This is not a V shape. Don't go straight down how to have a corner and then come back up. You sort of round that corner, right? When you get to the vertex, make a little round. It should be like a, a squished U as opposed to a, a V shape. Remember, V shapes are absolute values, right? V shapes are absolute values because they come to a corner, they come back up. All right, so one extra little thing I want to point out to you before we get some, uh, most of the time, I, I would say most of the time. Most time, we actually even know another point. Anybody can give me another point that's on this graph? And it's all about the fact that um, Things are um, symmetry. There's symmetry in this parabola, right? As it comes down, it's going to turn back up. It's going to start climbing back up. So yeah, this is the lowest point. And if that's the case, that means if it came down this way, as it turns around, it has to go back up this way, right? That little blue point. So you can automatically, most of the time, you can probably put in this extra point here to get you the little symmetry feel here. But there it is. Okay, are we good there? Does that make sense? Of course. Is it the this is the easiest one? Now let's work our way to more difficult ones. Okay, number two. All yours. What's happening with number two is it is concave down. That's what's the problem here. Um, what's the other issue here is that this one's going to be a little bit off the graph. So then you got to sort of think about how do you compensate for that, and I'm not sure why they made it that far off the graph. So try it yourself first. So again, y-intercept, easy, 8, done, x-intercept, set equal to 0, and they got this little negative on the outside. And again, with factoring, with quadratic formula, you can have a negative in front of x squared, that's fine. With factoring, you can't. So at this point, we have to multiply through by negative 1. And hopefully you did that. And factoring now, bless you. Uh, negative 4 and 2 are the factors. Therefore, x equals 4. x equals negative 2 are the intercepts. Therefore, 4, 0, negative 2, 0 are the points. Alright, and the vertex. Again, this is the only sort of probably n newest part here. Plug in the value. It should be a negative 2 over 2 times negative 1 or a just a 1. And that one we're going to plug in back into the original equation. And we get ourselves a 9. Okay, is that sort of off your graph on the match problems here? I think the match problems only go up to five. I think is that right? No, on that other graph, mm -hmm. it went off, but I just kept it two plus three. Okay, got it. And so the graph, uh, you got two choices on the graphs here. Um, your graph looks like this on the match problems. If you want to, you can change the scale of a graph. And so instead of going one, two, three, four, five. 
So just kind of cross this out and put 2, then 4, 6, 8, 10, and that will fit it. So you're basically scaling the graph however you need to. And again, and the question comes up, Mr. H, does the y and the x have to be the same scale? No. You can, you can make this 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and keep this the same. You can scale both of them, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and that's fine too. Um, if you didn't scale, which I think most students don't, so what you do is you sort of make it a little bit above the graph if you want to do that too. So there's my 0, 8, there's my 4, 0, negative 2, 0, there's my 1, 9, and then again this little blue dot is the extra little piece I can add to it, and then and again if you scaled yours a little different that's fine too as long as you put in those points correctly. I think you guys are sophisticated math 63 students, you guys can figure that one out. Okay, let's keep on going here. Let me just pause just a little bit here for those that need to make the graph. Okay, moving on to the next one here. Again, now a little bit more complicated. Let you guys start it off first here, get the y-intercept. The x-intercept give you a hint here something about the quadratic formula for the x-intercept somehow quadratic formula all right um, all right so y-intercept how about we get ourselves a zero one because it's just this number at the end boom x-intercept is the toughie as you said equal to zero uh, you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna check my discriminant why do stuff if I really don't need to do the whole thing because my if I discriminant is negative, I know no x-intercepts. If my discriminant is positive, I know at least what they are, or an approximation. So how about an 8? I give it myself an 8. Okay. It is a positive, so I got myself some intercepts, but it's not a perfect square. So I know that I'm going to have to only approximate the x-intercept. That's why this distinction. That's why the distinction of the positive ones being either a perfect square or not a perfect square. If it's a perfect square, then I know exactly what those numbers are. If it's not a perfect square, then I can only approximate it, and you probably need a calculator to approximate it, as we'll see. Okay, so I would do the discriminant first, and then I start off with my quadratic formula because negative b plus or minus, blah, 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 blah. That means I already know this little middle term right there already and I've done pretty much half of the quadratic formula already anyways so uh, negative of a negative 4 is a 4 plus or minus the square root of 8 and again if you want to you can even reduce it from here and already bring it down into the simplest form down here if you wanted to but uh, 2 times 2 gets you the 4 in the bottom that's kinda cool reducing some more um, 8 isn't that 8 is 4 times 2 and 4 is a perfect square of 2, so tell me if you guys agree this would be 2 root 2 over 4. And then can I reduce this guy? Yeah. 4, 2, and 2. A 2 can go into all three numbers right here. So we get ourselves a 2 plus or minus. That goes to a 1, and we don't normally write a 1 in front of the roots, so it would be a root 2 over 2. 2's everywhere. Okay, now we got ourselves still a problem. I don't know what that means. What is uh, 2 plus root 2 divided by 2? What is it? I don't know. Is that next to 35? Is that like 1.2? Uh, yeah. So in this case, you've got to grab a calculator or something else like that, and you have to sort of calculate. The only way you could do it without a calculator is if you knew that square root of 2 is approximately 1.4. That's the only way you could do it without a calculator here. So more like 2 plus 1.4 make 3.4, and 3.4 divided by 2 would make 1.7. Good there. And uh, 2 minus 1.4 would make a, like a 0.6, and 0.6 divided by 2 makes a 0.3. That's the only way that you would know. Otherwise, you have to use a calculator. <coughs> and kind of funny. I'll get to your question just a second here. Um, in other countries, particularly European countries, I had a few exchange students from there. Um, you know when you do the multiplication tables, right? You learn 2 times 3 is 6, blah, 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 right? In fourth grade or third grade or whatever it is. What they do at that point, they actually memorize the approximations for the square roots. 
that's part of the process. So you memorize square root of 2 is about 1.4. Uh, square root of 3 is about 1.86. And then you go on up to, I think it's up to 25. You knew usually 25 or 30, depending what school you go to. So you sort of have those little numbers in your head for quick approximations. I thought that was kind of interesting. And they do a lot less graphing than us, too. So that's interesting. OK, um, question. Ah, cool. When do you know that you would have an I in here? Is if this guy here, b squared minus 4ac, gave you a negative number in here. Cool. And then let's go one step further. If, you, if this was a negative 8 instead of positive 8, I would stop here and I would say no x-intercepts. Because if you have a negative number, if you have a complex number, you're not, it's never going to touch the x-axis. Cool? So that's the way to distinguish between positives and, ne and negatives for the discriminant. Okay, so approximations here. And I've got one more to go. The vertex. Negative b over 2a is 4 over 4, which is a 1. Plug in that 1 back in, and eventually we should get out a negative 1 in the process. And again, all yours to graph if you have not done so already. Alright, I'm giving you time to write that down if you haven't done so already here in the graph. So 0, 1 is a good, nice little number there. Approximations, 1.7, a little more than halfway to 2 from 1. And then 0.3, a little bit off the 0 marker. And then one negative one. And then, of course, i got to ask you this question here. What's the other point that we know? Perfect. 2, 1. That's the other point that we know. So if it comes down here, it must go start climbing back up, and it was going to hit 2, 1. Now, do you need to put that in? No. Nah. No, not really. All right. And again, make it more like a squished U shape, and there it is. Okay, with that, next one here, and uh, give you the hint, of course, for this one. Something about no x-intercepts. So Diane's question here, something we're going to get to that. Read your mind, made the PowerPoint lecture according to Diane's questions here. All right, I'm going to start as well here. Uh, I'm going to add a couple of new things into here as well here. Okay, uh, y-intercept, negative 5 is good. x-intercept, plug it in to give you a 0, multiplying through by negative 1 is what we probably wanted to do. So we don't have a little negative out there. And it looks like it is going to factor, and then we play around with the numbers, and I don't think so. Is that right? <clears throat> Can't get a positive 5, but then when you add it together, it gives you a negative 4. If this was a negative 5, then yes, it would work. No, but not with a positive. No, not going to work. Okay, so then the question is, it could be that still it's what we did last time here, which was a irrational answer here. But when I do the discriminant, so I got a 16 minus 20 and gets me a negative 4. As we said earlier here, I don't care if it's a perfect square or not a perfect square. There are going to be no x-intercepts. This is a complex answer, so therefore it's not going to have an answer on a real number line and the x-axis is a real number line. All right, so again, negative for the discriminant just gives you no x-intercepts. So huh, that's not fun. That means we have less points to deal with. Okay, so number three. Finding the vertex here, so negative b over 2a. So as we do that here, negative 4 over 2 times negative 1. And we get ourselves, eventually, we get ourselves just a 2 for the x-coordinate. Plugging that in. <clears throat> a 
negative 4 plus 8 minus 5, and how about a negative 1? And then so we get 2 comma negative 1 as a final answer. So we're going to do this based upon really two points, and that's it, just two points. Whoa, because there's no x-intercepts. <clears throat> so vertex, y-intercept, let's go for it here. I'll give you just a little more time here, people that are still writing it out, catching up. <laughs> Bless you. All right, I'm going to jump to the graph here. So negative 5, 2, negative 1 are the only points that I know of. Well, there's actually another point that I know of. What is it? Perfect. 4, negative 5, all the way down here. And based upon these two points, or technically three points, we get ourselves a graph. So notice, yes, it does not touch the x intercepts any, which makes sense for a parabola, right? It went up, but it didn't get far enough to get all the way to the x axis. Then it came back down. All right, let me do a few things here. Uh, time is running short here, so let me just kind of go quickly through this, and I want to add an extra little piece to 7.5. So number five just has this one interesting question. Find the largest value of y. Find the largest value of y. All right, something the book does not mention is um, this little piece right here. If you have a negative in front of, if you have a negative number in front of x squared, what that means is the graph is concave down. Good there. So let me write it like this. And so I'm going to just say this. If a is less than 0, remember the a value is the number in front of x squared. We've been dealing with that all day. That means you have a graph that looks like this. If the a value is greater than 0, that means you have a graph that looks like this. So therefore, we should, you still at least should know that. So looking at this problem here, I look at my a value. a value is negative. So therefore, I know I have a graph that looks like this. So what's the largest value of y? Well, notice it goes up, up, up to a certain point, and then it starts going back down, down. Hey, isn't that top point, isn't that a vertex? Hey, that's just the vertex. Actually, now we need the y value of the vertex. That's all. So let's do this here. Oh, did it over there. Negative b over 2a. Wouldn't that give me the x-coordinate of the vertex? Once I know the x-coordinate, I just got to plug in to give me the y-coordinate. OK, everybody good there on that one? The vertex is either the maximum point or the vertex is the minimum point, depending which shape the graph takes. In this case, since it's going up to a certain point, it's the maximum point. So negative of 12 over 2 times, whoa, negative 0 0.01, whatever that is. Again, use a little calculator if you need to here. Um, I'm going to multiply the 2 in. I'm going to do a old-fashioned way here. So first, I'm going to move these two over. So 1, 2. So I'm going to multiply by 100 on the bottom. Get rid of the negatives here. So that would be actually 1,200 divided by 2 or 600. And that's the x-coordinate. But I don't want the x-coordinate. I want to know find the largest y value this problem makes. So we have to plug in. And again, don't want to really bore you with the math, especially if I want to get through a few other things here. <coughs> I'm going to multiply the 6, or plug in the 600 back in. So negative 3,600 plus 7,200 minus 400. 
and so we get ourselves 3200 that is the highest value that y could be and now we've come sort of come full, full circle here remember about the shirt that we put in to sell at the store so if you do this financial analysts they start predicting okay when should be the high point for this sh for this shirt and so if you get a profit of 3200 like okay cool now it should be starting heading down so it's all this sort of calculated to see how things go okay another one here number six and then I'll show you one more thing here art supply store finds that they can sell X sketch pads each week P dollars according to the equation so there's a relationship between price and how many you sell that comes off of in real economics that comes off of the supply and demand curves that's what you use there and then you plug it into a revenue function revenue function is R equal to number you have and the price you sell it at and there it is there's the generalized revenue function we want to figure out the price that will cause us to have the maximized revenue that's cool and then also we want to figure out what the revenue should be if we do that Ooh, so this is all kind of cool everything's all together now okay so we know the relationship between price and quantity so since we're trying to figure out on for this graph we're trying to figure out the price so we want p to stay in there we want p to be part of our variable here so we're going to put in the value for x x is 800 minus 200 p times the p that was on the outside so this came as a substitution p is on the outside all right again not to get bogged down with the math here we're going to distribute the p to the 800 distribute the p to the 200 p makes p squared And again, me personally, I don't like to, the fact that the p squared is at the end. I like to write them in, in order from degree. So two, negative 200 p squared plus 800 p. There it is. All right. Um, so this would maximize. Whenever we talk about maximize profits here, again, what are we thinking about? We're thinking of something that looks like this, right? Going up, 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 up to a certain point. And we're talking about that point right there and then coming back down for a parabola. So vertex on our hands. So the p-value, instead of x, is going to be p. p is negative b over 2a because our variable has changed. And so negative, what is the b-value here anyways? Anybody? It's 800 right there. Yeah, it's the one that's next to the p value. Divided by 2 times a, and the a is the negative 200. And we get ourselves negative 800 over negative 400 in, th in that case. <coughs> All right, anybody tell me what that 2 means? Say again. No, we want the meaning, meaning of two. Perfect. We just figured out the price that we should sell it at to maximize revenue. So we just figured two bucks. We got to sell this guy at two bucks to maximize revenue. Now the question is, what is going to be the revenue? If I, f if I sell it at two bucks, what's it going to be? We're going to plug in back into our revenue function, of course. There it is. There's my revenue function. And if I do that, I should, again, I should expect right around $800 as my revenue. All right, and again, there's one thing that is not mentioned in, uh, in the match problems here. I wish it was. So we've got to look at this here because some homework questions have, we have to deal with it here. So first of all, let's jump to the equation here. So, so far we've been dealing with jump to the beginning part here um, whenever we graph these so far we've been dealing with a trinomial right have something like this x squared minus 2x minus 3 this is a trinomial three terms 
there is a special form we use just for graphing of parabolas and it's a lot faster form and if you can put things into this form you're doing good and it's this form right here y equals and then you probably should write this down it's a on the outside x minus h quantity squared plus k and it tells you all this stuff here and it's on page 469 Again, sort of adding this in. Last minute, okay, just to be fair, how about this here? Well, I'll take number 13 from the homework, which is a problem that you will be doing anyways. <clears throat> so we're going to have to graph this. So why is it, why is this so much easier <coughs> is because this we call this actually graph form of a parabola everything you need is given to you right there just like y equals mx plus b right you got the b you got the m and you're graphed and you're done no need to do any work same thing here so it says with this parabola the vertex is h and k the vertex is this h here and this k here the only thing you gotta be careful for is notice you have a, so you're subtracting h as part of the problem so right away before you do anything else, you know the vertex. Anybody give me the vertex? Do that again. So I'm going to go with positive 1. Positive 3, we good? Because again, the minus sign is part of the formula. So if this was x plus, two, if this was x plus 1, then the vertex, h would be a negative 1, we good? The negative part. Of it. So vertex, I got. Uh, next is the y-intercept. Now this one becomes a little bit different here. Because remember we knew we were going to plug in a 0 in for the x, right? So it's not this number at the end anymore. So if I plug in a 0 for the x, let's see what happens here. 0 minus 1? Negative 1. Negative 1 squared? 1. 1 times 2? Plus 3 more? 5. Okay, cool. Do you see like almost all the stuff is there? Now, can we graph this? I think so. Let me make a little makeshift graph over here, real quick. Two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, vertex is at one, one, two, three. Ding, ding, ding. Y intercept is five. Oh, okay. Well, one, two, three, four. That's right here. All right, anybody just out of curiosity can give me another point. Uh -uh, so careful here. This it doesn't go like this. It doesn't go this is not the ver this is the vertex here. Yeah, I go 2 5, right? We're going to go over one more this way. I'm going to go up to 5 here. There's my other point. Hey, do you know right away we don't have any x intercepts? No point in finding them. And so there's my graph. My graph comes down this way. Touch, turn, touch, up. Okay, this is called, uh, again, sometimes it's called the graphing equation for parabolas. Notice you're not writing anything down. Okay. One more thing I just want to mention. Sorry, I'm going a little bit over time. You're just real quickly here. When you graph this online, something like this. Uh, you're going to have to choose what you're going to draw a parabola, just so you know. And then what you do, you're only going to use two points. You're going to have to use the vertex. Vertex is going to be your first point that you plug in. And then you can plug in any other point you like. Are we good? So you're just going to use two points to plug in your graph. If you want the y-intercept, that's cool. If you know one of the x-intercepts, you're cool like that too, okay? So again, you're going to use two points. The first one has to be the vertex when you're graphing. And notice on this one here, you should be able to graph just by looking at this equation. No work needed. So this is negative 1, negative 4. Boom. And then if I plug in a 0 into that, anybody tell me what the y-intercept is going to be if I plug in a 0? All uh, right. Oh, sorry. Oh, I don't have the right graph. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Parabola, right? I need the parabola, so I need to take that. Negative 1, negative 4. 
and seven, and there's my graph. Okay, good there? So we know.